school discipline, uh, we are uh, we have a bill that I think we're getting close to to moving. Um, and then Senator Ron was kind enough to uh, throw that all in the air. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Uh, was kind enough to put in a bill related to school discipline. Uh, and so I think. Um, did you need to get that, Senator? Okay. No, do you have like a dollar jar that I should Venmo you for? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and so before we, we take any steps, it's important to try to see if there might be a place for this in S-16. I know you've talked to Senator Sears. Um, and so with that, I thought what we could do first, uh, if it works for your schedule, Jim, is just have Senator Rahm tell us about the bill, uh, the genesis of it, uh, what you hope to do and to see if maybe there is a, a spot where we could um, place it, given that we have uh, just, uh, you know, one more week after this to, to handle uh, work before crossover. So with that, Senator Rahm. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Campion and committee. And I do appreciate you giving this kind of another look before passing it out. Um, and the chairman asked me to be very prepared. So I have lots of charts and graphs and studies at my fingertips in case people want more information, but I'll just really start with the genesis of this and, and Jim was there for the play-by-plays. Um, I introduced legislation, I believe starting in 2014 to try in the house um, to try and limit the use of suspension and expulsion as a behavioral tool. Um, you know, being a new senator, uh, Senator Sears and I started talking about collaborating on this issue very early on. And we thought, you know, let's have one bill where we're, we're co-sponsors of more of a, you know, study and let the schools and, and districts decide what to come back with and what makes sense for their communities. Um, and once, and, and he, we had talked about how my, my being the lead on a separate bill that would really ask us to, to call this to question a bit more and limit, fully start limiting the use of suspension and expulsion as a tool and, set, and what we would call excluding kids from school as a way to manage their behavior. Um, once this study started moving, I really didn't want to put out a whole separate bill that seemed to kind of contradict what we were asking the districts to do from outside of the state house, you know, it can be very complicated if you say, we're putting this out as a conversation piece. Um, the, the few things that I just couldn't let go of and may end up deepening the study component in some way um, are the experience of suspensions and expulsions, but particularly expulsions of children under the age of eight. Um, and actually, as I was doing my research, um, what became clearer and clearer is a lot of other states, and maybe the committee's looking at this as well, are actually starting to look at the pre-K experience of expulsion because pre-Ks um, without being regulated the same way as uh, K through 12 education um, tend to expel kids at a rate about three times higher or more. And within pre-Ks, uh, so within childcare centers um, and early education settings, they are, they are um, ex the, the racial disparities and other types of disparities are even worse. So I have some studies that I could share with you um, to that end, but the pre-K to prison pipeline is a real thing that a lot of states are looking at. But at the same time, that would require a kind of more nuanced approach to this legislation to deal with pre-Ks. So I, uh, my bill, I believe, with which does two things, and one is um, call for us to stop expelling children under eight, would then you'd probably be looking at the data from kindergarten, first grade, and second grade about how many students are separated from their school um, because of an expulsion. The challenge is the data that I have from the Agency of Education, happy to share this chart with you, um, is uh, by grade. So it starts with kindergarten and you will be able to see, and I can share my screen if it's helpful for folks, um, that about 10% of our separations from school happen in kindergarten, first grade and second grade. Um, and what's a quick question, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm just wondering, so by separation from school, that is suspension 
and or it's, it's both and all <laughs> they tell you in these charts is the average number of days of the separation okay. and that even follows into high school so i'm sure by the time you get to high school they much more clearly break out who got who got suspended for a day or a week who got expelled forever who got sent to a different school but what aoe is currently tracking is separation from school and the average number of days and so it's fewer days the average number of days is about one that kids from kindergarten to second grade are separated from school, but it's not possible to tell which is suspension and expulsion. And if you wanted to take more testimony on this particular issue, either agency of education or, an, or in addition, um, Jay Diaz from the ACLU are the ones who've been tracking this most closely. Jay's on vacation, but even from his vacation, he helped point me to this chart so I could get you, you know, that specific information. Um, and, and one thing that he added is that it to, to based on their work and the, we had this included in our 2014 bill to stop um, expelling children and at a very young age, um, meaning separating them from the school environment, excluding them from the school environment. Um, he, he would advocate that it's fourth grade and below. Um, you know, that seems to him to be a pretty good cutoff for a very young child who needs interventions rather than exclusion from school. Um, Do you have a sense, Senator Rump, why students are being suspended or expelled from kindergarten? Any so, please. Go ahead, sorry. No, please go ahead. They have elementary school, middle school, and, and, and high school sort of broken out of like, really in all cases, um, about at less than 10%, and definitely in elementary school, less, less yeah. than 10% are violent okay. um, in nature. It's, it's a lot of um, behavioral issues, disruption, et cetera. And then, you know, this, the whole experience with the four to five-year-olds, the kind of pre-K issues, many have to do with parents not being able to get their child to school on time, the child acting out, you know, um, exhibiting inappropriate behaviors, but, you know, a lot of it, and that relates to the second piece of this, which is also encouraging the committee to study how truancy is handled around the state. Um, we have some we have some, uh, you know, counties that have said, or districts or counties, because it's a county level issue if it gets kicked up to the state's attorney as a kind of more criminalized um, issue. But we have some counties and districts that are saying, we're not touching truancy at all in the pandemic. We have others that are very much, you know, calling on families to do better and um, s still sending cases to the state's attorney. So if a school feels like they can't intervene in the appropriate way, um, with a family or they have sent a certain number of, of communications out, the case goes to the state's attorney's office. Now, I don't always want to use Chittenden County as an example, but they had a whole countywide task force to say, is there any way we could stop criminalizing families for truancy? And so they looked at a lot of, you know, check boxes and other, and other things you need to do to offer wraparound services to the family before a case goes to the state's attorney. And it's resulted in a much lower number of truancies that get advanced to the state's attorney's office. I have looked at other states, I have some of those charts and graphs available and where they have implemented statewide interventions pre, before sending a case to uh, you know, the judicial system for truancy. They've seen an, you know, cases of truancy that result in the criminalization of either the youth or the family. In Vermont, we don't criminalize the youth. We're, we're one of a handful of states that doesn't criminalize the youth but we still do potentially criminalize the family for truancy, the parents or the guardian. Um, and so states where they've stopped criminalizing the family as well and looked at ways to intervene in cases of truancy, they've significantly dropped the numbers of truancies, the, the days missed of school, the, you know, really intervened in the appropriate ways into what that family might be in crisis or might be lacking some key resource that helps them get their child to school on time. So those are the two pieces. Sorry to yeah. jump around a little bit. No, no, it's, it's helpful. And I appreciate you being here and having a discussion with us since we are, you know, timing, you know, we're, get, we're not there, but, you know, we, we'd like to start to advance some things. Uh, and I know this is something that uh, the pro tem is interested in and others, you know, school discipline in general, uh, particularly as it relates to, uh, if you will, um, minority students, you know, and students, uh, d disabled students. But one of the things I'm wondering, I mean, 
trying to get your sort of thoughts on is, so if I'm speaking, uh, honestly, I, I worry a little bit, but my committee may completely disagree, uh, that we as a committee would be making a dis- sort of that kind of policy decision. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it makes more sense for it to come from the Agency of Education. As I mentioned to you, Senator Rahm, uh, on the phone, I mean, I'm just wondering, is there, it's the legislature sometimes in the state sometimes does say never, ever, ever, ever. But uh, I, I do worry that there are going to be cases where uh, a suspension or expulsion is warranted. Uh, what I wanna make certain happens is the educational experience continues, but might there be something where uh, a teacher comes to a principal or uh, another school into, you know, personnel and says, you know, this really does warrant um, a suspension, even though I know the gravity of what that would mean for the child. I mean, that's, I, I, again, just thinking about it, you know, to, to be sent home as a kindergartner as, at any age, but particularly young, young age, suspended or expelled is something we would want to avoid at all, all costs. So that's just some of my thinking. And the committee might uh, say, no, they're perfectly comfortable with moving in this direction as you, you've outlined, or do we kind of somehow incorporate it into this overall study that we're looking at and saying for the agency to come back and, and make some real decisions for us along this. I don't know if you have thoughts on that or. I do, you know, because I, I can understand the gravity of this particularly approaching crossover without a lot of additional testimony. I would say, and I'm happy to, you know, work with Jim further on some drafting, but I would say there's three things that the committee could possibly do to strengthen the existing study. Yeah. Um, you know, after doing all this research and, and really appreciating yeah, you, yeah. Mr. Chair, for allowing me to come back in and keep chewing on this with you all. Um, you know, one, many states are starting to track the experience of, ex- of expelling children from preschool, um, even if they have no control over that. Um, they are starting to sort of pay attention and keep track of, you know, which child care centers are expelling a lot of kids? Is that an experience? And, and they are seeing huge racial disparities and income disparities and in who's getting expelled from, from um, pre, pre-K, as you might imagine. Um, when it, you know, when it comes to this, this issue of what's the right age to just say, we really shouldn't be expelling children. Mm-hmm. I would love to see the agency of education come back and say, yeah. here's the age. It's second, third, fourth grade. It's some age where we say, you know, that we really can't find a good reason yeah. that we should exclude this child from a school environment, have their whole family and them go through the trauma of what do you do now? Where do they go to school? How many days do they miss school while they're trying to be placed somewhere else? What, is, what does it mean to be in that new school? Um, you know, and then, and then um, you know, this truancy piece, just sort of adding that for your consideration because it's sort of another way that we punish families for crises and other things affecting the young person's absence, not behavior in terms of what they do at school, but just their lack of presence from school is sort of often another sign of some kind of distress that we're not intervening with uh, properly or carefully. Yeah. Committee, uh, questions for Senator Rahm at this point. Um, and Senator Perchlet, please. Yeah, thanks for, for being here. Thanks, Chair. The um, question, I don't know, it was a question or a comment. Um, but what do you think, Senator Ram, is the, the bill isn't a study that, you know, the one you co-sponsored, the other one, it's a task force to say it will, we will end expulsions right. for everybody. From, yeah. So so it seems like we're already there, but I just reread it and I thought we could strengthen there because it says make recommendations to end expulsions. So maybe we just say implement a prohibition on expulsions or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does say, except for the most severe circumstances or something like that. But I, I wondered if you felt that was, you know, if, if you thought we need to change that word, because it seems like taking your your new 84 bill and just adding it to 13 is the best way to go since you're sponsors of both. And if you thought that language that we had in there, because it was just a study, it seems like we don't need another study, but since it's kind of like, okay, how do we implement this? It seems like that would be the way to go. Right, right. You know, I, I mean, it, this is just a data point of one, but having, I mean, you know, the reason I introduced this bill originally years ago was 
you know, really traumatic experiences where, where a child was, you know, had, had an accident or did something on the playground and, you know, were suspended or expelled. And, 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 you know, a lot of parents of color were coming to me and saying, I don't know what to do. I don't even know if I can live in the state anymore. So, you know, I have seen certainly so much of the urgency and the trauma of removing a child from school. I think the only thing that might balance that out is the trauma of being, being on the receiving end of some kind of behavior and, and being triggered by having that person in your immediate presence. And some schools may be so small that there's no way to separate them on a larger campus or put them in a classroom that's much further away. So I really do still try to balance, you know, that experience of, you know, what it means to be a victim. I, I, I was saying to the chairman, I was arguing with my fiance about this who grew up in Charlotte, you know, I mean, he was seven when his, his uh, um, friend on the school bus made him, sp made him spit a spitball at the bus driver and they both got suspended. And he said it like straightened him out and made him a better person, you know? And then I said, well, what happened to the other kid? He said, oh, you know, he's in jail now or something. So it was like, yeah. okay, well, you know, if you have a family structure that says what, you know, what did you just do and really intervenes and uses that as a tool, but you can get that intervention without that suspension or expulsion where another family might say, great, forget it. You're, you know, you're never going back or wh whatever the case may be. So hopefully, you know, when these ideas were proposed, a lot of them were in that restorative justice framework of if you're not going to, you know, expel or suspend a student, what are you going to do to repair harm to the victim um, of whatever they perpetrated and make sure they don't have lingering trauma that goes unaddressed and, you know, help that person part in be empowered to repair the harm so that they ultimately take more responsibility for their actions in the future. I, I so I, you know, I know we're talking yeah. about restorative justice yeah. too, so it's jumping all over. So Senator Perksek, you're proposing that, you know, given the way uh, our 2.1 is written that we, and S84, that we, in a way, merge both of them. It seems like the easiest way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Senator Lyons. You want to uh, weigh in? That was actually a suggestion I was going to make, and and then the other, the other question is, um, Senator Ram, if you have any of the data that you would like to share with the committee to support um, our decision, that would be really helpful. Would it be preferable in a in an email to the committee, kind of as a package of information? That, that would be that would be okay. terrific. Okay, great. Um, That'd be great. Senator Hooker, Senator Chittenden, any concerns with that uh, movement to, to merge these two? I think I, I, I would support that in that, you know, we have important pieces of each of them. And so put them together rather than trying to um, do one or the other. And certainly yeah, it would make yeah. a lot of sense. Okay, Senator Chittenden, okay. It's good to have people from Chittenden County on here that you can influence, even though. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. We're, we're a team. It's a team <laughs> effort. Right. That's right. I, I do have a question That's regarding yeah. um, uh, alternative situations for yeah. you know, students who have, you know, perhaps serious issues. You mentioned, Senator Ron, that, you know, a small percentage are uh, because of violence some, that kids are expelled. Um, we do have um, alternative ed, you know, um, here in Rutland. And I know that there have been some very young children who have been, you know, put in alternative classes. How would something like this intersect with the bill? or the, the attempt to sort of ban expulsion. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure your committee is constantly trying to look at, are they, it, it, what does separate but equal look like? You know, whether it's special education or English language learning or alternative programs, um, you know, are, are they, is the intent ultimately to help return them to the school environment or is it a place for them to get relegated? for the remainder of their time in school. And if that happens to them at a very young age, you know, then, then what? What is the next step? Do they ultimately get returned to the 
um, feeder, you know, at, do they, is that a feeder school back to the middle school or high school or, um, you know, do they get sort of left in an alternative program for, for the remainder of their days? We should have more data on these things and, you know, we should know, I mean, what we get often as, as senators is stories that break our hearts that seem to not add up to, you know, the full picture. And then we know that we're probably not going to necessarily hear the stories when something pretty horrific did happen necessarily. Um, so, you know, better data to know, is it a temporary move to an alternative program? Do, do they get put back in with the regular school population? So much of the language of these reports about exclusion and separation remind me a lot of special education and ELL where you could just end up feeling like, uh, you're not a part of a larger community for a long time and that can have a really detrimental effect on your outcomes and your ability to function in society and you sort of end up on that continuum to feeling like an outlier from society which is what we end up calling the school to prison pipeline. Yeah no I really feel like we're tackling something uh important here and we're going to look to your support on the floor uh when we get any questions <laughs> especially yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, very eloquent committee members. I don't know who's reporting. But I'm sure they'll do better than I. Maybe Senator Chittenden. <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, to disappear off the screen. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for your advocacy. Uh, we do have about 11 other bills of yours in this committee that we are uh, working to advance. Uh, you know, one, one other in particular, though, we heard wonderful testimony this morning or this afternoon, like 20 minutes ago, uh, from a Mr. Yin uh, from Winooski, who also spoke of the incredible work that uh, multi multicultural liaisons do. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's also hopefully something we might be able to package up into, uh, we're hoping into our miscellaneous bill. So Senator well, Wong, thank you for taking the time from government operations. Uh, please remember our kindness when you redistrict all of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just by virtue of this being my second or third visit, um, I'm biased, but I can tell you're doing really amazing work and it couldn't come at a more critical time for our kids who are feeling really isolated and lost and uh, like they need a sense of belonging again. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. And if, if the press is listening, hopefully they captured that. You have a you have a great <laughs> chair committee. I have said that before. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you, Senator Ron. Thank you, Mr. Demaray. Uh, yes. I think um, seems like a very straightforward. Uh, even though I'm usually the one that needs walkthroughs more than anyone, I don't know. Is there anything uh, overarching that you'd like to say about the bill? It looks like it's the committee's preference to to merge the two. Um, and again, it it does look pretty straightforward. Um, it does look like we'll all need a fiscal note, and I'll request that from Joint Fiscal before we vote it out. Uh, but I am hoping to to move this, if at all possible, um, uh, in the next day or so. So you want to merge them? Um, do you want to turn the pro prohibition on expulsion for uh, students under age eight into a uh, Part of the report, the, the study, uh, for recommendation on that, or do you just want to put that in as a requirement? The way I'm reading the committee, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm misreading the committee, is uh, that we should put that in going forward as a requirement. Is that, I mean, that looks to me, or is, or did I misread and folks really feel, senators feel as though they would like this as part of a study? Senator Perchlick, you made the initial comment, please. Well, the, the way it is, the, maybe the, we need to change the wording of, on S16 or whatever the number is, a little bit, 18, to say that it's clear that we're ending expulsions except for the most extreme situations. So that includes people under the age of eight. Uh, under right. the age of eight. So I don't know if we, if we need to include that specific language in, in the other bill, but I, we might want to be clear that that their that the recommendations are basically here's the new policy. There, there we shall not have expulsions. How how does that work in a school? How how is each district going to deal with? Because if you just say you can't have expulsions, I can see 
just a bunch of questions coming back from all, every school district saying, okay, well, what about if they bring a gun to school or what, what, what's our responsibility for those children that we, that we do expel under the extreme situation? So my understanding of this task force, which I don't think we should call it a study, right? the task force is saying, we will not have expulsions. Here's how you deal with, except in these extreme situations, here's what those extreme situations are. And here's how you implement it. You know, we talk about in the, in the bill about um, uh, let me get to that language it's on page four, I think. Yeah, the, the right, we're, we're asking us to do the data collection and analyzing, but just kind of how they're, how they're going to, to make this happen in every, every school. Right, to inform strategic planning, yeah. guide statewide and local decision -making. decision making. Yes. Yeah, like all that stuff. Great. I mean, that's the way I, I see it. I don't know if that helps. Or yeah, that, that, does, that gives us, you know, that that's going to help answer, I think, a lot of concerns out there. Again, that this task force is looking at this and going to be strategizing and working and informing school districts how how you know how to work with students. Of that, yeah, please. Well, okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So, Jim, do you think that the language where it says make recommendations to end suspensions is is ending suspensions, or is it just making recommendations to end them? You know, so like, hmm. at what point, if this was how it passed, would, would suspensions and expulsions end at some point in the future and we would need further legislative action or, or would this be sufficient? So you get, you get specific language now in the bill, right? In um, um, S16. Yes. So what, what, where are you looking exactly? Lines like line seven on page four. Yeah, my, my doesn't have page numbers. Let me find where I am. Hold it's on. section section two, the creation of the task force. Uh, Third line of that task force and school reform report. Oh, right in the creation section. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're recommending they're recommending to you. Um, Making recommendations as to ending suspensions and expulsions, but you would have to take action based on those recommendations and change statute. The statute currently permits these practices, so you have to make a separate change there to implement that. Okay. So if you wanted to, you could take uh, Senator Ramp's language and prohibit expul expulsions for children under eight. And then add to the study a line that requires them to uh, look at how school districts could implement that in terms of how they would help school districts decide how they would deal with the fact that they can't expel these kids. So you can add that to, to your, your, your task force if you want. I'd be for that. And also, and maybe the wording is already enough there to say that, yeah, we're, we are going to end that expulsions for those under that age. How do we how do we implement that? But then also tell us where to draw the line for the extreme expulsions. And I, I wondered if we need what I would guess on my point of view, I would like to have it say that kind of it, it is the policy that for even all, over eight, we don't want to have expulsions, but maybe we, we need to draw the line somewhere. I, I agree what I think the chair was saying to Senator Rahm that there are these situations, like we heard from Secretary France, if somebody brings a gun to school, I think the school should have the ability to say, okay, you're not coming back until tomorrow. We need to figure out what's going on. So I don't want to just say there is none, but, but somebody needs to figure out where that line is drawn, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what this, they're doing, I think, already, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. Yes, but, yeah. I guess it's back. I, I I guess I was reading it wrong to your original question, 
in our campaign is that we do, sounds like we would have to add that language from S84 about the not allowing expulsions under age eight. I'm just wondering if there's a way to say something like, uh, so the extreme example would be if the individual is going to go, cause harm to himself or others, him or herself or others, that that provides for some um, protection and allows for decision making. That isn't that the that's usually the phrase that's used um, in in a variety of areas. So yeah, the potential to harm. Yeah. Others. So they may not have actually done it, but they have a weapon or something like that. Senator Pershley. Well, I, I wondered if Senator Lyons was making that comment in reference to the eight-year-olds and under, which which I'm okay with maybe, but I yeah, so that's what I make that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. We were looking for the, the extreme cases. It would seem to me that would be about as extreme as you can get. You know, so I mean, if it's harm to oneself, then you would want to ensure that the school would have in place some referral system or support system for the kid. And if it's to others, then you want to make sure that the child is home and the family, if there is a family or the guardian or caregiver knows. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that schools have to do. And so that, that I like Jim's suggestion as well. Uh Senator Persler? And Jim, in this context, in this part of the statute, when it says a student, how, how is that defined? Is that, you know, to Senator Rahm's point about, does that include preschool kids or does it only, you know? Preschool is tricky, right? Because um, preschool that happens in a school is under AOE jurisdiction. Preschool that happens in a private care center or family home provider is under human services jurisdiction. And they have joint rules that kind of cover these areas, but uh, it's not quite clear uh, to me what the expulsion and um, uh, suspension rules are for pre-K kids in child care centers and family care homes. I'm, I'm not sure what that, that is. And, but, it's, but is Title 16 only dealing with kind of schools under the control of AOE? Title 16 in this area is quite complex because it's got joint authority given to AOE and AHS to oversee these programs. But the programs are under, while they have joint rulemaking authority for both, uh, they are siloed in terms of, of oversight, uh, AOE for in-school, AHS for private censors. So I just don't know the answer to your question about what happens in those child care centers and home care centers or family homes on, on this question about how much what rules apply to them. It's a great question. I mean, it, it's, yeah, we're saying, I mean, I, I'm inclined to think we keep this pretty narrow and it not, and it be clear that we're not talking about you know, private home centers, you know, uh, something somebody has it, you know, a parent might have it at their home. And, and I think we tighten that up, Jim, to either say, you know, pre-K uh, through, again, uh, well. It's under age of eight, but I can say under age of eight enrolled in a school, right? That'll carve out the private side. Right. The school is defined. Yeah. Yeah. Public school. Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So am I hearing that you want also to add a caveat to her prohibition to say, except in the case of extreme circumstances. Such as. I, I use the right words, but yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. yeah. Or you Senator Lyons language. That yeah. That's what I think. Senator Lyons yeah. Yeah. is the way to go. Yeah, okay. And then, well, maybe, I don't know if that other language needs to be changed about the recommendations. Right, so that's a, I think that's, you know, something we have to decide, are these 
recommendations that they are going to come back to us with, or are, are we asking them to, you know, implement a policy? Well, yeah, they, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Because the, the, the um, because suspension and um, ex exclusionary policies are in statute. So yeah. they can't do anything more than make a recommendation to you because you're going to have to go change the statute to implement that. What, is, what do people think? I mean, I'm trying to think of language. So what would the language be, Jim, if we were to, if we wanted this to happen immediately? I mean, we're basically saying, I mean, no matter what, they're going to have to come back and talk to us, right? I mean, unless we were making a policy that was completely overarching and we're bad adjective, but in, unless we were saying um, we're getting rid of suspensions and expulsions right now, any work that's being done in this working group is going to have to come back to us. Right. Well, this is what calls for. They're going to come back to you. Yeah, right that's what I mean. I mean. I'm just trying to think. I'm not sure if Senator Persick, were you thinking about altering line seven where it says recommend to end? Or to say, um, or to end suspensions. Either way, it, it kind of comes back to us. You know what I'm saying? I'm not sure yeah. if that's helpful or. Yeah, I guess I guess I think that we probably keep it the way it is, and that there are complications, and you know, might even come up with the under eight year olds, but. That, they, that they, it's better for the task force to look at it holistically and then come back to us and say like, okay, here's, here's how you need to change this. Yeah. We, it says pretty clear we're going to end it. So they can't come back and say, well, don't, don't end right, it. Right. Right. We're directing them that, that that's the way we want to move. But the task force doesn't have the power to end. I understand. Right. right? Yeah. So all, all they can do is come back for recommendations. Right. 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 Is there a, um, is there a date certain by which that it will end? regardless of when the task force comes back. So in other words, the task force could come back with very compelling reason not to end it. And then, um, but in the meantime, we could say um, that it will end. So we could say it's going to, end. I, let's, let's just pick a date out of our heads. Um, it's going to end January 1st, 2022, or no, March 1st, 2022. Uh -huh. And the task force report will come back um, January 2022. There's two months there for any change to that um, effective date. Is that something we should do, or do we? I don't, how, do, how does uh, senators feel about that? I mean, that gives it. I can. I mean, either way is fine with me. I'm happy just ending it, but. Um, right. Then, but you do want the task force to feel like they're actually doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Let's leave it without the date for right now, if that's all right, Senator Lyons. Oh, I'm fine. Okay. And yeah. then, um, Jim, do you have enough direction just looking that it's after four? And I know we have a chairs meeting and Senator Lyons, you need, you feel free to go when you need to. And I think Senator Hooker, I don't know if you go to those, um, but feel free to. Yeah, I'm fine. I can, I can, no, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Persecutor or Senator Hooker, final Just questions for question uh, Jim? To clarify as far as um, under eight. That yeah. Would be immediate. And anything else would be um, subject to what the recommendation of the commission is. I'm sorry, would you repeat the first part of that? Uh, banning, banning expulsions oh. for kids under eight would be immediate. Yeah. And then the rest would follow as the uh, debt is collected. Exactly, save for circumstances as outlined by yeah. Senator Lyons. Yep, okay. Okay, all right, so uh, if Jim, if you'd be so kind as to email the entire committee a new draft when you're done. Sure. So that would give people an opportunity to look at things this evening. Uh, yeah. We could comment some more, uh, and uh, I will ask Joint Fiscal to um, uh, do a, a fiscal note, Senator Chin. And I want to remind you uh, about four weeks, five weeks ago, uh, we were working on this, and it looked like we were nearing completion. You said, "Well, if sausage making is this easy, 
It's fine with me. Um, now we're really into making sausage. It's gonna be great sausage. Yeah, it's gonna be great sausage. I like that. Uh, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, Jim, thanks again. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.